Okay, we're back. We're live two o'clock. This is military in Hawaii on a given Thursday. I'm Jay Fidel. Today we're talking about the spouse licensure bill, HB 961, pending in the Hawaii State Legislature right now. You will be interested in this show. Um, and we have uh, Major General Suzanne Varis Lum, and she's with Pacific Indo Command up there on Camp Smith a very important command and a very important job, and she's been on the show. Therefore, she's very important to the show. Thank you for being here, Major General Suzanne Harris-Smith. Then <laughs> we have also Jill Barrett. She's a, a medical, licensed medical what, technician. Um, what? Tell me what your role is, Jill. Hello, thank you for having me. My name is Jill Barrett. I'm a certified registered nurse anesthetist. Nurse anesthetist, okay. And we're going we're gonna to talk to these guys about this program um, that, that is um, the subject of the bill, HB 961. But let me preface all that by saying that you know, I practiced law in the state of Hawaii for like 50 years. And guess who our best applicants were? Well, maybe I shouldn't say this in public. They were military. They were, they were military, uh, more often military wives. Um, they were a special breed. Okay? So the, we liked them very, very much. They always worked out. Um, the other side of it is that from the point of view of the military, um, you need to have strong families in the military. Uh, you need to have people who are uh, in those families occupied and employed. And it's very important that the state of Hawaii offers them an even playing field to get jobs, especially if it's jobs in areas for which they've been trained. <clears throat> and, the, and the problem, and we'll hear more about it from our guests, the problem is that right now there's a certain bureaucracy um, where the individual looking for the job who may have been trained or has license, licenses elsewhere uh, has to wait for a long time, even longer than a tour of duty here, in order to get that license activated. This is a real problem. Um, and frequently, there's a requirement that the individual be a resident of the state of Hawaii. I'm, I'm not sure that's a legitimate requirement, that, actually, but that's the way it is. And this bill is intended to clear that up. How close am I when I say that, Suzanne? Am I, am I accurate in reporting that to you? Absolutely. You know, I, I really appreciate uh, the opportunity, Jay, first of all, to talk about this bill. You know, it has gone through two committees. Now it's going to the... Um, uh, next committee, and then hopefully we'll pass through there. And and I and I'm grateful for the governor who has supported this and introduced it because he and as well as many legislators, you know, who agree that we need to support the military. And I'm grateful for that. But also that Hawaii can benefit from a lot of these uh, need areas, especially healthcare, just like Jill, um, where we are short or even short in engineers. Uh, we, we have talented spouses out there who are, you know, licensed in multiple states. And when they come here, you know, in some um, occupations, you need to, you cannot be out of work for a certain period of time. And if you are, then you, you know, you lose your, um, your, your, your um, ability to be hireable. So, you know, shortening that timeline for these spouses is really critical. Um, and really, you know, one of the concerns have, that's been brought up is it does it take away jobs from our local residents? And really, it, it we're talking about a lot of areas that they can meet shortage areas. And some have brought up, well, we don't want to water down our licensure process. And really, that's not what this bill is asking. It's just asking to streamline the process, not to eliminate standards. Of course, we must have standards for consumer protection, and that is definitely the case. But many of them come with lots of experience and also um, amazing skills that our state of Hawaii needs. And this is not limited to Hawaii. There are, um, I guess, the, the same issue exists in, in every state, really. You want, you want an even playing field for military dependents, and for that matter, military who are retired. Um, I hope this applies to them, too. This is basically really for the spouses who are rotating out because they're only here for a short time. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, it's really that two to three year period. So currently this bill is, is specifically targeted for military spouses, active military spouses, um, you know, because really overall it helps our retention as well. When we say that Hawaii is an attractive place to come and be stationed, 
it's the family unit that is looking for opportunities. And many of them are moving across the country so multiple times. And this allows you know, all of us to be in sync to support our less than 1% who serve in the United States military. Yeah, well, this is, it's, uh, <clears throat> it's very important. And uh, we can't afford to, we, we have to make a soft landing for them. We have to make the state work for them. Some of them really need the money. Um, <clears throat> and we, we need them. They're, and and, and what, what's remarkable, you told me before the show, is that the Department of Defense, you know, DOD, in Washington, in the Pentagon, cares about this. Ergo, you're here and you're advocating for it. Um, but also, you know, the, the Department of Defense is advocating for it. And uh, did you tell me they, they come testify? They care about the passage of this bill all the way in Washington. Um, that really means something. It doesn't happen every day, does it? No, absolutely not, um, Jay. Yeah, DOD in this last committee round of hearings testified in support, and they've been doing that in states throughout the country. And in some places like Illinois, where they have already um, passed something similar that allows it to be much easier for spouses to take their existing licenses and quickly obtain a temporary license to a permanent one in the particular state that they're in. And, and it, it really helps because we have a lot of uh, high tech, uh, healthcare, um, much uh, need areas to come and help the state of Hawaii. Sure. As a matter of fact, we're, <clears throat> we're lo losing high quality professionals every day uh, from the civilian side. And we have a doctor shortage. There's an example of it. And I'm sure we have medical, medical specialists uh, like Jill. We're losing them too because um, you know, they leave and um, they don't come back. And uh, I suppose COVID has an effect on this. Um, let me ask Jill, didn't he, why don't you tell us your story about how you came to Hawaii with a license already, a license that had been at one point active in Hawaii on a previous tour of duty. What kind of trouble did you run into? Sure, I'm happy to share this. Um, in, in 2014, we left Hawaii for the first time. We were stationed here and I kept my um, nursing licenses. So I have a registered nursing license as well as an advanced practice nursing license to practice as a registered, as a certified registered nurse anesthetist. And I kept them in an inactive state where I just paid really minimal fees every few years, just with the hopes that possibly one day we would return here. And if we did, I thought, wow, this will really make it easy just to convert it to active. Well, in 2018, when we found out we had orders to come here, I went ahead and looked online how to do this, and I had to fill out a hard copy application. There's nothing online to be able to just quickly convert this. So I did the hard copy application. Now it's March, I haven't heard anything, make phone calls. The Board of Nursing, I think, is really overwhelmed with phone calls. There were times that I would um, literally redial 20 times. And I kept notes just to, because it was becoming unbelievable to me how difficult this was. And I would have to redial 20 times just to be put into a queue to talk to someone. And I could be in that queue for an hour. And I'm trying to, and it's a six hour time difference between the East Coast where we're stationed in Hawaii. So I'm doing this as I'm leaving work, as I'm bathing children, as I'm making dinner and just trying, like sitting on hold, hoping someone would answer. I get someone would answer. I'm sorry, that person isn't here, but we'll leave them a message. Then I would get an answer. Well, I'm sorry, that person's new to this job and I'm, I'm not sure that she knows how to process this. Then I would call, I just kept calling and calling. And I finally got to the point that I said, can I speak to your supervisor? Well, my supervisor's in a meeting. Can I speak to that person's supervisor? Sure, I can leave her a message. So left a message, heard nothing back. Then I'd call again a few days later, go through the same process, wait in, you know, get into the queue, wait an hour, finally get someone. And I said, I cannot get off the phone right now. We're talking now it's almost three months. I need a license to apply for a job in Hawaii. And so I finally got in touch with someone who happened to find my application sitting on the desk and they, and they quickly went ahead made a change in the computer and they said, okay, you're active. And I said, wait, what? It just took that, just a quick little input into the computer and I had an active license, but it took three months of me calling and trying to get in touch with the right person and sitting on hold for an hour. And I mean, the process was unbelievable. So in the state of Hawaii, in order to even apply for a job, you have to have an active license. So now I'm three months of waiting to get my license activated, and now I can start the process of applying. What, what makes this 
really un un unpalatable is that, as I recall, you can correct me, but we have a nursing shortage in Hawaii. So the state needs nurses. They need you. Right. Yeah. And yet, and yet you run into this kind of obstacle course. I find that extraordinary and actually a violation of the government's duty to the public, the government's duty being to provide an adequate number of trained nurses. So, right. um, uh, Suzanne, I mean, how do you feel about this? And it's okay to express emotion. <laughs> well, you know, I think that is why the governor um, really backed this, as well as many legislators in our Hawaii state legislature. And that's why it's now moving to the third committee. I think they all agree, um, as well as the um, DCCA, you know, that looks at um, providing these licenses. And, um, you know, some of them, if I could share, the occupations are pr predominantly healthcare, you know, dentist, dispensing optician, mental health counselor, certified nurse aide, licensed practical nurse, registered nurse, nursing home administrator, occupational therapist, optometrist, pharmacist, physicians, physicians, assistants, diatrists, and the list goes on. A lot of medical healthcare. But what's not on here, um, what was deleted from the last committee was one of them where we do have a shortage, which are engineers. And that was removed from the list. So, you know, one in my testimony, of course, as an individual, um, you know, I think that that's an area that they need to look at and adding back in. And if not this round, maybe the next round on engineers, because I, we have a shortage of engineers. Um, and even if some of them come in as young and, and, and uh, new licenses, um, I think even level one engineers, we have a shortage as well. So um, that's an area to look at. Well, yeah, I, I mean, and you know that uh, these things take, sometimes they take a few years of trying before the bill actually gets passed. And then, uh, you know, you pass it in one form and then you have to go back and fix it the next year and keep on plugging at it until finally you get something that works. I, I, I actually find it extraordinary and, as I said, a violation of public policy. So query, um, you know, who is, who is opposing this bill? I mean, you don't have to name names, just give me general categories. Who would oppose a bill like this? I, I think there has been general concern um, that, and not general, but um, some, some members, um, not many though, were, were concerned about giving licenses or preferential treatment to DOD spouses, um, and then therefore um, endangering the consumer by giving a license potentially that was not up to standard. But that's really not what this bill is about. The bill does not at all ask for anyone who is, you know, doesn't meet the standards of education, training, um, internship, whatever is required for that particular profession must be met. And in many cases have multiple licenses from multiple states. So for example, we had a, uh, a general officer who was here, his wife was a dentist, licensed in three states. She came here and saw that his tour of duty was only two years here, tried to see if she could get her license transferred, very difficult. She ended up not practicing and we, you know, here, um, but she did end up volunteering with uh, taking statistics for monk deals, you know, so she took her scientific uh, background and data to help Hawaii on a volunteer basis, but we could have used her expertise. And of course, I asked her on the side because my daughter got her wisdom teeth taken out. And I said, what do I do? Her mouth is really swollen. So she gave me some free advice because I knew she was a dentist. And, but that's just the kind of heart she had. I mean, I just think about, you know, we lost out on that opportunity. Also another uh, officer who was here, his wife expressed to me, uh, she was a uh, very, um, she was a, a therapist, uh, a physical therapist and very experienced and highly sought out after about my age, so she had, you know, decades of experience, but she, she gave me an earful sharing with me how difficult it was for her mm -hmm. and how she had to wait. But once she got in there, full speed ahead, excited, participating uh, in, our, in our society and community and giving back. So, you know, those are some of the stories, but and so to, I guess, clarify for those people who think that, you know, we're changing the standard, we're not. We're upholding the standard, and I would say we come with people with higher than the standard, with a lot of experience, and also infusing the state 
with new ideas and new ways of doing things. We see this in the teaching market, right? Some of our teachers that come in and they, they've experienced the different experience in another state and here's a new idea. And I'm not gonna take jobs permanently, but I'm gonna infuse into the state some fresh thinking. All the, all the more important. Um, let me say that I, I am always, as I said at the inception, I'm always impressed with the level of A, competence and B, motivation that you find from military spouses. And uh, in a legal office concept, they were terrific, one after the other for you, years and years. And I came to that conclusion with lots of data to support my conclusion. And, and you know, Jay, if I could say something else is I feel like the spouses working in our communities also link the military with the local community. They become part of that family, whether it's our hospitals or the community members, and they actually bring that back to their home, to their military uniform spouse. And it really bonds us together as a community when our spouses are integrated and not just on the base, but in, in, our, in our schools uh, with other local families. Sure, part of us. We want them to be happy when they're here. We, we want the United States military to think of Hawaii as a, as a really good duty station, as a, a treasured place to put on your wish list and try to get back here as often as you can. And ultimately, although this, as you said, this bill does not address it, uh, ultimately to retire here, ultimately to you know, invest their lives here. This is the kind of immigration or in-migration that we really need. You know, there's a lot of press lately about how people are leaving the state. We have to attract them here. And one great source of people to attract is the United States military. Um, I'm, I'm with you 100% on that. So, so, Jill, I mean, I understand that nurses talk to each other. Is this true? <laughs> we do. Are you, are you the only one with a story like that? Or, or are there others that you have managed you know, to I, connect with? We do talk, but I haven't heard of, I haven't heard of others' difficulties like mine. I guess we really haven't talked to that extreme you know we're busy at work we see each other in the break room we're busy in the operating room so um and a lot of my um co-workers are local and they've been here a long time we do have a handful of us that are military spouses so it'd be interesting for me to pick their brains but um i felt like my story was definitely unique so i wanted to speak up for all military spouses because we do i believe bring a set of um skills that sometimes I practiced all over from Virginia to Alaska to Hawaii to Kansas. And even though medicine is medicine, there's tweaks and little things along the way that you do differently. And it's just, you know, it's really, I think, very good for our whole population to bring in those types mm -hmm. of um, aspects into the profession. And then I couldn't agree more with integrating and becoming part of the community and the family. When we were stationed here before, I started work in Tom DeBoyd the next month. And though my coworkers, they were my family. And I, I mean, I couldn't have existed that month. I felt like without them. And, and that is just a huge part of being in this community. And I think that's why when we left, my heart never left Hawaii. So that's why I was like, I can't give up my driver's license. I can't give up my nursing license. And cause I just felt like there's gotta be a way that we'll come back one day. And then it came true. And we were back in 2018. Did you testify? Yes. Good. You'd be a powerful witness in a hearing on this bill. <laughs> uh, you know, the other thing is, go ahead. I sent in a written testification, yes. <laughs> the other thing is that uh, maybe this is um, something that has happened in the past, but isn't happening now. I recall that for the lack of a sufficient force of nurses in, in the hospitals and the like, they grew up a system and maybe this is a national system where the hospital short of nurses would, would, would tap into this national uh, exchange of, of nurses. And, and you'd have traveling nurses, um, independent contractors who would come out to Hawaii and yeah. on, a, on a contract and spend a month or two or three <clears throat> and then leave. Um, and, they, and they would, you know, they would, they would fill the gap. Yes. Uh, I don't know if that still happens. I guess it does. Huh? Yeah, the but hospital it, it, I work at in Honolulu, we still do, not for nurse anesthetists, but for registered nurses, for our scrub techs, 
they do bring in um, travelers to fill in the gap. Yeah, so it, it strikes me that if I was a nursing, or rather a hospital administrator, and I had a choice to hire a, a, a military dependent nurse or a nurse who was an independent contractor coming here for a month or two, uh, I, would, I would take the uh, military dependent every time um, because this, this, she's not a gig worker or he is not a gig worker. It's, it's a more of a commitment. Um, would you make that comparison? Oh, I agree. I, I think that you're more vested. You know, you're here, you're part of the community, you're contributing. I think in general, I mean, we're loyal. I mean, we come to work, we do our job and we exceed in every way. I, I, that's how I feel. So when you have someone that's just coming for a few weeks, four weeks, six weeks at a time, I think it's a completely different feeling. And it's, you know, they're here, Hawaii's beautiful, let me make it into a little vacation, make a little money also, but it's a different sense, definitely. I think being part of the community is what makes this island so unique and so hard to leave. You know, Suzanne, next time you need a nurse, a nurse and an anesthetist, ask for Jill, okay? That's right, I will, I plan to. You can always request to me. Call a nurse, call Jill. <laughs> How many people, Suzanne, are affected by this? <clears throat> if you're in the ledge and you're testifying in the bill and somebody says to you, you know, HB 961, it's a handful of people, right? No, it's more than that. Can you talk about the scope, the reach of this bill? Yeah, so, you know, as I mentioned, um, we have, you know, the large military presence here on Oahu. So, you know, you know, 40,000, depending on who you're counting, 60,000 with ships coming in. But in terms of stationed here, we believe maybe about 15,000 that this would affect or impact. But we don't know how many, we don't really have a clear number. We have a lot of anecdotal evidence. Many of them that come in as teachers, this bill doesn't affect because the, the Department of Education has a different process. So that seems to have been ironed out. So we do mm. have a lot of military spouses in our education system, and that's great. Mm -hmm. uh, this bill, you know, doesn't cover lawyers or accountants because there's certain state laws that they'd have to, um, to um, you know, acquire to be it's, able to- Yeah, it's different it. for sure, yeah. So, but many of them have done it. I have met some lawyers and some accountants who have, who have gone through the process. Of course, that took longer. But of course, this one, really a lot of healthcare, as I mentioned, and I think, of that 15,000 military spouses currently living and working in Hawaii, I imagine there's a large percentage that are in the medical field. We are still seeking out the accurate numbers from the components, but as you know, this is the headquarters of the largest and oldest combatant command. So we have a huge number with Pacific Air Forces, Pacific Fleet, US Army Pacific, here at Indo-Pacific Command, Special Operations Pacific. So, you know, getting all that, the data uh, the specific number, but right now we're going with the 15,000. Okay. Well, you know, the thing is, this is an important strategical port uh, and base, um, and we have to do everything we can to make it comfortable. I mean, Dan and Noah isn't around anymore, um, but we have to make sure that uh, the Pentagon sees this as an attractive base, and everything we can do to make it attractive to the military here, we should do it. Uh, we want Absolutely, them to stay here. Jay. Absolutely, that goes to our retention, goes to attracting the best family units that come here and that can integrate on all levels. And, you know, again, you know, the state of Hawaii acknowledges that a lot of, most of the leaders do, and they understand how very important it is. And that's why many, most of them are backing. I would say, you know, every, most everyone that I've encountered and I've talked to about this, they get it and they support it. And I'm very, very grateful. Yeah, that's great. So I want to I want to uh, bring this to um, you know the, our present situation for context. Um, we have been through and we are still in a pandemic, and you're talking about healthcare. Uh, you're talking about you know what was 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 an immediate and, and life threatening crisis a year ago, which potentially is you know still the case. Um, but I wonder you know what the pandemic, what effect the pandemic has had. Uh, on the nursing industry, as far as we know, the military nurses, as far as you know, the military spouse nurses, the ones that, that would be affected by the bill, 
um, and you know, and, and the military's position vis-a-vis -vis those people. Um, how has it affected your initiative, Suzanne? Um, you know, COVID-19 has really highlighted and put our heroes off of just our war fighters but all on our medical care, the Jills out there. Are they're all, they're all war fighters now. <laughs> they are, they are, they are, they're fighting COVID. Yeah. They're, they are on the front lines of this, this pandemic. And, you know, we have seen a shift and change and, you know, just talking to all the Jills out there, medical professionals, doctors, and just thanking them. You know, it was always often just the uniform people. Thank you for your service. Thank you for your service. But you know, our healthcare responders are out there giving these very um, invasive COVID tests and <laughs> inoculation, the vaccination, um, dealing with already existing illnesses and a COVID virus in the hospitals. And then also, the, the, and Jill could probably speak to this, those who are regular uh, patients, how, you know, not having visitors at the end of life. So um, I'm sure Bill, if, I mean, Jill, if you have anything to- Oh yeah, Jill, have you been involved in that? I mean, because that is, yeah. oh, that's oh, it's so touching to be there and be the only one and, and be acting essentially as the family. Um, I've heard stories. Giving them comfort. Yeah. yeah, I've heard stories, but my responsibility is primarily in the operating room. So I, you know, I'm giving anesthesia in the operating room to patients. I have not, um, and a part of the end of life care, you know, there's the, the COVID unit is just a hallway over from where I work. So sometimes I walk down that hallway to get to an operating room and I just imagine what it must be like. Um, but I haven't personally been in that situation, but it's just devastating from, you know, just what I can imagine. But I am a little bit more isolated in the operating room, taking care of patients, putting them to sleep, waking them up, giving sedation. So intimately involved in them in close proximity to whatever they bring to the operating room. And in the beginning, we didn't know what patients were infected or not. And now we do a really good job of screening all of our patients. And then it helps too that we're vaccinated. So that's another um, benefit to going to work and feeling a little, a little safer than before. Now, be that as it may, however, the average person who has the need to go to a hospital these days um, <clears throat> without COVID, no COVID involved, still has a greater level of concern about going into the hospital, into the maw of a place that could be could be right. infected and, yeah. and winding up with a surprise result in the process. And I would bet you, yeah, I mean, you, you, you tell me, but I, I would bet you that, that life as a patient is different uh, after COVID and your engagement with that patient is different because he or she is looking for the comfort to soften his concerns. Am I right? Yeah, I think that it definitely does bring more anxiety. And also, you know, all the layers we have between our patients now, all the PPE we have to wear, you know, it's more difficult to hear each other. It's more difficult to, to have that contact with people because you're just, you know, if you're N95, you get your face shield on and it's just like you're trying to Develop this rapport with someone in such a short amount of time, and some of the time it's hard to hear you. You don't have the lips to read anymore. That made it easier. Um, they're wearing a mask. Everyone's behind all these layers of protection. So I, definitely, there's more anxiety. You come in, you've got to be screened at the front door. I mean, everything has changed for sure. I think it's getting better. I think people are less anxious, but in the beginning, for sure. And then you go to a hospital and you hope. For the best and the safest experience, but you never know what you're going to walk mm. away with. So, will you will you stay for a long time? Uh, will you come back? Uh, have you? I guess from what you said, you will come back. You'll be invested in Hawaii. You're you kind of made made it your long term home. Am I right? We aren't sure yet what our long term goal is. <laughs> My husband is still active duty army, so um, we shall see. We do love it here. We we try and imagine what life would be on the mainland, and we we just can't. I mean, especially during the pandemic, where you felt like you were in such a bubble of safety and everything going on that wasn't even just the pandemic, but everything else going on in the world that was crazy. You know, we just we feel so safe here. Our kids love it. We love it. We love the people, love the weather. 
I don't know what we'll do. We haven't figured out what we want to do when we grow up yet. <laughs> yeah, see, the problem is you're too young. <laughs> you have too many years left. <laughs> too many years left in the service. And, and, and the wonderful thing about the service is, you know, you you investigate and uh, go through an adventure in every duty station. And yeah. get to, you really get to see the world, even right. in the Army, as opposed to the Navy. Right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> So, Suzanne, you know, what this the whole discussion gives me a, a good feeling in the sense that um, uh, the DOD cares about how the spouses do in Hawaii. Uh, I, I served in a, in a committee in the Coast Guard, and it was our job um, to make sure that they were okay while their husbands were at sea, which sometimes would be a deployment of several months. And, and you wanted them to be okay. You didn't want them falling off the side. You know, if you're alone, you know, if you don't have the support of your husband right there, then um, you, have, you have issues and risks. And so I, I can see this as a benefit to the, to the military uh, to make sure they're okay. But also I see it as a, a larger piece of the, the presence, as you said, of the military in, in Hawaii, which has been going on a very long time, since 1850. That's my own planning point. In 1850, the United States Navy was in Pearl Harbor, long before anything much happened in Pearl Harbor. And um, you know we we we're bonded at the hip. Sometimes people forget that. Um, so this is all that special connection that the Chamber of Commerce engages in Military Affairs Committee uh, to try to keep it connected and remind people that, the, as you said at the outset, that the military is part of our society. But let me let me offer you the opportunity, Stan, of what you would leave with our viewers about this. What would, you, what would you leave with our viewers about this bill, about other bills, about amendments to this bill that may come forward, you know, about the, the attitude of the, the, the legislators and the public on issues like this? Thank you, Jay, for that opportunity. I would say that, first of all, I am grateful for the leaders in the state of Hawaii that have introduced this bill because they acknowledge how very important everything you just said, Jay, but also how important the military is here for Hawaii, not only for our security, but also our economic security. And we saw that this past year with COVID, we saw that um, you know, the defense industry, you know, our, our presence here really contributing to the um, economy. The second largest contributor to Hawaii's economy really is the Department of Defense. And it's just not the military member. These are people who work at our Pearl Harbor shipyard, but also their families all of the military families that come here and are integrated into our communities. You know, we are part of Hawaii's ohana. And just like you said, we're part of Hawaii's history. We have a long heritage, even local families of military service like myself being from here. Uh, this is part of who we are. This is the landscape. And in our military, we encourage everyone to be a part of taking care of the place, the culture, um, and the environment. We want to be good stewards and family members. Ohana, really. But thank you, Jay. That's why I love this show. Thank you very much. Major General Suzanne Barris Lum and uh, an SSS nurse, Jill Barris, thank you very much. Thank you for this show, but also thank you for what you do. I say that as I pass into the Kaneohe area to go to the Oak Club and a century you know, says hi to me, I say, thank you for your service. So to you guys, I say the same thing. Thank you for your service. Aloha.